All right, should be recording another draft science video production and such comments, and then I guess some other stuff, usual routine maybe. So father come home has gone on too long. Mother is worried. Okay, I don't know what that means. Some kind of druggy, I guess. Blah blah blah. Goodbye. The tripping sponge is yes. whatever. Um. Uh, wise monkey, hey dude, I tell you what, a blast of a video, smiley face. Value of a contribution, I tell you what, I value your contribution. Yes, so, so I'm just, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not very helpful, frankly. Nope. Uh, <laughs> yeah, his comments are just terrible. Alright, here's a 458 page long blah 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 of Tesla crapola. So we'll read the preface in regards to tesla's system these are the quotes directly from his patent okay let's understand he had 400 patents so he patented lots of crazy ideas <clears throat> so this is one particular one now later he argued that he could do this same thing you know person to person uh which is silly but anyway that explicitly explains the print he meant point to point discharge nature of his device there was no device and that he it relies on current transmission through gases and not on regular radio emulation. Yes, yeah, so of course he's trying to send essentially invisible lightning, you know, from point to point through the upper atmosphere. So if you read all this crap, it's basically an argument that you can send up giant balloons. So that's the point to point part. So it's not the, like I said later on, he says he can directly transmit the energy right to anybody on Earth. They could just have a little radio antenna. They don't need it. So this one, his patent is for sending balloon way up into space, 50 miles up. <laughs> yeah, not close, but anyway, the higher the better anyway. Into the rarefied atmosphere, that is the atmosphere with less gases in it, and that uh, somehow these gases, uh, like oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen, are somehow more conductive, um, you know, in thinner quantities, and that um, you can just transmit a high voltage uh, zap of electricity, you know, uh, a lightning bolt, across the atmosphere, you know, to some other point, and that somehow the lightning doesn't want to go to ground, it wants to go to this other point in the atmosphere. So there was just absolutely no evidence that you could send lightning horizontally and have any hope that it stays horizontal. So theoretically, that wasn't stupid. The ground is there. The ground is a powerful influence. And so the best you could do is, you know, shoot your little pop gun and have them, you know, five feet horizontal for 100 feet down kind of thing. But anyway, regardless of that flaw in, in the, this brilliant theory, um, the very idea that con the, the light gases become um, very conductive. So his whole theory was that somehow they become very conductive. And very conductive would mean that they could actually handle electricity going through them and not destroy its potential. And the argument, I think, rationally can be made is that a ton of its potential is lost to heat and light and a lot of other stuff. So they're basically melting a conductor. So they're sending electricity through it. The conductor is melting, which is a huge loss of energy. And, um, you know, it does, you do get a voltage at the other side, but you get a lot less than what you started with. Just like you could imagine that lightning loses a lot of its voltage and its, uh, its wattage um, by the time it reaches its destination. It was a it was more powerful when it started than when it finishes, sort of thing because it does create a lot of movement of atoms, and it has to um, ionize the atoms, and then it creates a lot of photons, you know, very bright lightning. So, lots of losses. So it's not a very good conductor. It's just a conductor that, in his brain, somehow it wouldn't matter if you melted it, kind of thing, because the dripping metal won't fall on you. <laughs> but it doesn't matter that you're melting the atmosphere. It does matter that you have to ionize all the... You have to ionize your path. Creating a plasma, it, 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 the argument is, is, it's not for free. You don't create it for free. So it's not a very good conductor. So his whole premise was wrong. 
the whole thing is idiotic in the sense that you can't create the potential difference between the two points. I mean, I can't put a big tower up in, in the United States and then put one up in France, a big balloon, and create a potential difference between those two points that's going to be more than the potential difference between ground and those two points. So even if I put it 10 miles up the balloon, okay, if I put the thing that I'm receiving more than 10 miles away, you can sort of logically understand that there's no chance that the energy is going to go to this other point. It's going to go into the ground. And as I pointed out 400 times, that's what every experiment he did demonstrated with his giant tower, is that all he did was shoot a bunch of energy into the ground. All right, so enough of this. Fuck you. This, this nonsense of defending Tesla. Because he wrote a patent doesn't mean any of his theory was correct. His theory was stupid overtly um, not realistic so fuck you okay uh, yeah I, I mean you post a lot of crap I won't delete it but it's crap no fuck you um, you didn't need all that shit to explain well his idea was to put up uh, put electrodes very high in the atmosphere and transmit um, electricity in the form of essentially sparks traveling, ionizing a pathway, ionizing gas, uh, making a pathway to another electrode many miles away, which again has no theoretical reasonableness. All right. Um, how to be less stupid? Okay, question mark. Yeah, uh, yes. So, God destiny. Go destiny? Yeah, God, you got God in there. You're an idiot. Anyway, uh, just move it. I don't know. What the fuck? Yes. Be less stupid, please. People. Alright, so this ambiguous idiot. So, with this little infinity symbols. Isn't that all fucking so goddamn cute? Look, I already explained it to you. I already told you all I need to tell you about what it is to do logic and to think. And you want to try to mystify it. Well, that's your thing, okay? I'm just saying that's what you're doing. You're just putting woo where there's no need for the woo. We live in a very mechanical universe, and the simple processes that take place to create anything that we have the illusion of complexity it's just made out of a Rube Goldberg kind of thing. It might do something that seems interesting, but fundamentally everything's made of the little gears, and each little gear is a simple mechanism. And you want to pretend otherwise, then go ahead and pretend, shithead, but there's no evidence for your woo world. Uh, thanks for your reply. <clears throat> I would argue that for its validity, so he's arguing for the validity of what I basically said is just woo physics. You're just sitting there looking for the extraordinary explanation instead of looking for the ordinary explanation. If you look for the ordinary, you can find the explanation. Physics didn't do that, and it's to their discredit, okay? I mean, since Newton, they really haven't been looking for simpler mechanisms to explain things. They've been looking for something more complicated. <clears throat> Due to it being which being that which explains the generation of matter. It doesn't explain it. So again, with, I can explain the generation of matter by making up any preposterous story I want to make up. I can, I've already suggested story. the universe started, see the universe is just a perfect fabric of nothing. The universe is this machine that just purses nothing. And then it made a mistake. Like all, like all things, there's a defect in it. You know, the gear doesn't mesh right after 600 million meshes or something. You know, and it loses a photon somewhere, and that one loss of photon means the gear doesn't hit quite right, and blah, blah. Well, anyway, and then the, the the machine broke, and it created something, because that would be an error. If you were creating, if you have a machine that makes nothing, the error would be making something. Uh, I mean, you can come up with any kind of preposterous bullshit for creation. Any story will do, because there's no way to access the real story. And the real story I'm telling you is, no, I'm just saying that there's no reason to disbelieve the simple explanation that it just happened. That's the way it works. That's what the universe does. It had a choice. It could be making nothing forever, or it can make something forever. Oh, it decided to make something. Big deal. Um, anyway, um, through itself, I mean, so again, and being itself. So whatever that poetry means. I mean, that's just such mush talk. 
you know, through itself and being itself. The matter made itself. It thought up its own self. I mean, I just, this is just so fucking, it's such baby goop. All right, everything I'm saying, all the evidence points to evolution. Okay, every all the evidence points to things evolving into complexity, not having it innately. And you don't understand that, then fuck, I can't. I got no help for you. You're trying to fuck it up. You're not. You're not fucking it up by accident. It is essentially the first half, second half of being physics. Whatever. Again, is essentially the first half. Second half being physics. So the first half is nonsense. Um, let's make up a silly creation story. Um, no, the second half, yes, is obviously we can deal with the present and a little bit of the future and a little bit of the past, but we can't deal with the long past. So, you know, our physics can't access the long past. Um, so, yeah, we can't um, deduce a good abiogenesis theory for matter itself. But the fact that we can't compose it doesn't mean that the theory is not there. It doesn't mean that the, the, the mechanism isn't there. And that the mechanism would be as, as simple as the mechanism for abiogenesis. In the sense it's just an evolving into complexity. Two things get associated and three things get associated. And you have a mechanism that uh, makes that redundant. Like smashing the fluid against the rocks and it creates a bunch of little water droplets. I mean you can imagine the formation of the first cell and how it got reproduced by being broken in half. I mean, lots of things can be imagined and understood. You're just trying to make it wooey. Um, physics used to be referred to as natural philosophy. In fact, that doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. And the two words, smashing the two words together, doesn't make any sense anyway. What, what is the alternative? Unnatural philosophy? I mean, it's just bullshit. Again, philosophy is just the idea of what are you doing? Oh, you're trying to deduce the, the, the truth. You're trying to uh, accurately state the truth. That's what philosophy is, accurate statements regarding what is. And that's all physics is supposed to be or any science. Science is the only thing there is and it, it's not even, you don't even need a word for it. Thinking. You can think rationally within reasonable um, parameters are you can allow your imagination to create Bugs Bunny verses. Uh, philosophy is strictly not a religion. Well, it is the way people are practicing it. So there's, you know, there's no arguing that you can't take the fact that the word philosophy is just totally tainted by you wooicals. Um, the aim is for it the aim of it is to attain uh, rational understanding. Well, if that's what the aim would be, then I would say fine. But is there anything rational about believing in fairy tales? Is there any rational than you, your mother tells you a Winnie the Pooh story and you believe in Winnie the Pooh? Your mother tells you a Donald Duck story, you believe in Donald Duck. Just depends on what story your mommy told you and you believe it. That's all we see as evidence of what, where people derive their philosophy is they basically get it from their mommies. And that's it. They don't go any further. They don't do anything called thinking or do anything called rational. Is it rational to believe it because mommy says so? No, that's not rational. On that which is unable to be physically examined. Well, again, of it, a lot of it is able to be physically examined. Clearly, the form of the human being can be well dissected and it can be well understood that it has a bunch of vestigial crap and you know there's it's obvious that our spine and a lot of things changed over a period of time we're not optimized we're just uh, um, practically functional barely um, and that's the process of evolution it's clear we evolved uh, you want to pretend otherwise go ahead and pretend for example what is actually logic as itself it's it's actually just taking facts and you put two facts together like two plus two and you know that this is something different than two and two and this is different so now you call this four now that isn't a complex thing to be doing it's a very mechanical thing and the concepts are just as real as two-ness and four-ness and fifteen-ness you just find a ness that something has everything has properties Okay, the properties are a nestness. This has like hardness and this has like blueness. These are concepts and those concepts are real properties. So again, you want to pretend that everything's woo and it's not. Everything is in fact just mechanical 
and when you accept the fact that yes when you mix blueness with redness you can get violetness that's how it works yes it's real it's physical uh, for example is actually logic itself can logic be explained as a physical entity yes just as much as mathematics can be converted into just putting numbers that have the right weight on a scale right I remember this in kindergarten the only thing they did right in, in my education was to have a toy and it was a scale and you could hang numbers off of it and the numbers had a proper weight so when you put two and two on the scale it, it, it balanced and when you put two plus two twos over here and a four over here that balanced so yes it's mechanical the reality is a mechanical reality um, so yes logic can be explained as a physical entity in the sense that the properties are physical properties they have uh, definition they mean something if something's blue it's because it's different than something that's red and the difference is a real physical difference oh, fuck I'm sure you would agree that would be absurd. No, I don't agree that that would be absurd. Like I said, everything that is a property is a distinction with a difference, not a distinction without a difference. So everything we identify as something different than something else is because it has different properties. It has different properties because it's physically different. A brain that thinks God did it is different than a brain that does the things uh, God didn't do it. They're different physical things. You may mention of the universe analogistically as like a checkerboard. I analogized physics, okay, the existence of something and nothing, okay, and the idea that you have checkerboard. Now we have something, that could be the force, and now you have checkers, which are the electrons and the protons. So yes, I used Feynman's analogy. I just said, look, it's really simple, the mechanism there's there's nothing to it really you're just playing checkers okay and the board the force basically obligates you to make certain moves and you only have certain capacities in terms of what can happen in the sense of you move um, forward or you jump which could be the same as you move in free space or you interact with something All right. Let's see, analogies like the a checkerboard that we haven't entirely uncovered. Yeah, well, my argument is is that they haven't uncovered it, they haven't discovered it, because they're so busy like you, doing this infinity bullshit and other wooey crap. They're chasing a bunch of dead ends. They're walking roads to nowhere because they want the universe to be more interesting than it really is. They want the truth about human existence to be more interesting than it really is. And all of you are just practicing a religion. Would you agree that not everything can be explained with practical investigation? I would, I would only agree that there's some facts to this case that are so distant from us um, that all the fingerprints and all the footprints and all the signs and all the evidence has disappeared, been annihilated. So it's like somebody a million years from now trying to find the human race in space. Well, there might not be anything left of it. There might not be a single brick. There might not be anything in any kind of form that can be recognized as having a connection to the existence of a civilization on Earth. Um, and that just might be the fact. So there might be not any place to get information to to do any reasoning about or speculating rationally about the existence of something for which there's no evidence left behind. So I'm saying the creation event is so distant that all those footprints have been washed off the sands of time. And so yes, you're not likely to practically investigate creation. But gee, just fuck you, you're just, what are you doing? What is this crap? I mean, what what is this little infinity crap? What do you think it all adds up to, except you're a fucking goddamn bug that can sing and dance? That you have a little scheming, self-interested of mind, that you're, do, you're capable of doing all kinds of calculations about how I get what I want. Or if you're a little bit more 
cultured and sophisticated, you might be able to figure out, well, I can't have what I want at somebody else's expense. I can't exploit somebody else to have what I want. I can't just use somebody else. I can't just rape somebody else's interests to gain my gratification. So you're a little bit sophisticated, a little bit civilized. And so then you do more scheming, though, in still figuring out how how do I get, you know, how, how, do, how, do, I, how do I do the right thing <clears throat> for essentially the wrong reasons that is because it'll I'll get a badge or I'll feel cool or something like that so it's very hard to escape your fucking human nature which is just a selfish bug uh, but we can um, elevate the conversation and that's what I would say a, a, a rational person is going to do is recognize there's nothing in this that's anything magical the first goddamn green slime that we evolved out of wasn't put here to create human beings that wasn't the objective <clears throat> and we're just another form with different weapons that's all really we have we have the weapon of a scheming brain so we can think of elaborate ways to squish things and where other bugs just stab it or you know squish it or you know step on it or chomp it with their big giant teeth okay we do our carnage in a more sophisticated way a more complex way still the same thing still the same empty belly needs to be filled um, you know penis needs to be polished blah 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 you just you just ugh, it's disgusting what you're doing <laughs> yeah it's just disgusting this ingrandizing bullshit and it's all you're trying to do you're just trying to ingrandize and validate um, uh, a, a, a freaking horrid system of meat grinder carnage so fuck you you're stupid alright <clears throat> well, that's it I mean, the comments are just terrible uh, it's nothing new the videos are hard to find somebody has a link to anything useful uh, in terms of a producer of a physics video I mean these are just this is just horrible crap <laughs> it's just nothing nothing it's just so depressing um, it was something like depressing I don't know exactly what it is but oh, what the hell is this oh okay that's I do okay all right, so I'll take a pause, and I guess we'll just do a, another overview type video or some kind of crap like that, trying to re-explain it and try to do it in such a way as I don't confuse you uh, by going too fast or going too slow or going too something. It's always it's difficult. Um, saying it the way you need it to be said. <laughs> because each one of you needs it to be said a different way. Which is really irritating. Yeah, it should be back. Um, so, we'll just do the same thing. So, in space, there's nothing. Okay, there's just nothing. That's what space is. It's nothing. And there's something in the space, is the argument. So, the space isn't an ether. The problem with ether is, ether doesn't allow you to do, like, any angle. You know, because ether would have to be made of something that can perpetuate in semi-straight lines and so you'd have to have a forced geometry and there's apparently there's no evidence of a forced geometry and so you don't need an ether if you want to force one into the picture go ahead but you don't need one and in fact i think there's something and there's nothing so so the first something is the first two okay is that there's two kinds of force there's something called a proton force, we could say, and then there's something called an electron force. And it's just a bit, uh, a thing, a little object, a little bit of stuff that can carry something called momentum. That is, it can affect things when it hits it. It's not nothing, it's a something. Now these are the smallest bits of something in the universe, and they're the only bits that ever exist when something called a force affects something. So when there's a field or a force, the field or the force is just a description of what these little bits are doing. What's their character in that location? So um, 
I don't really want to go this far ahead, but we'll do it. <laughs> um, so I can have this field of these little bits. And they're all just moving the speed of light in a direction. So I usually draw them as an arrow because they always have a vector they're heading. You know, they're just moving straight lines in little vectors. And a field would have, can have, a mixture of them, or a magnetic field, for example, would have a lot of blue ones in one place and a lot of red ones in some other place. But in the natural universe, you could argue, the one unaffected by a magnet, see, a magnet would be creating a field, okay, that was um, predominantly proton force at one side of the magnet is producing, you know, the red end is producing the red field <coughs> and the blue end would be producing the blue field. This is a problem with explanations. I'm already getting to magnetism. And I didn't want to get there yet. <laughs> I'm still in the two. Um, but I just want you to understand that a force or a field is always a description of what's this stuff doing. So when it's mixed, it's like gravity. It's a field of, of uh, unsegregated stuff. And when it's magnetism, it's segregated. That is, the, the red end of the magnet is taking the mixed stuff in. Okay, a mixture of blue and red comes into the magnet. And the magnet reflects the red. And it, it diverts the blue. And so the blue ends up coming out this end. So the red will come out this end, the blue will come out that end. It'll have a dipole field of influence in the environment and something that's likewise polarized in some respect is something that's purely blue here would feel a lot of blue force okay so it's really simple anyway so that was going further than I wanted to go so just understand the only two properties this has is its color and its velocity in a direction so it's just a bit of force of a particular kind, proton reflective or electron reflective, moving the speed of light in a specific direction until it hits something to change that direction. And that's it. All right, so the other two here is the other plus two, okay, is that there's two kinds of matter, okay? And matter is uh, doesn't have the same properties as that stuff. The matter has, um, the capacity to interact with the force. Oops, that's not what we want to do. Right. So we have two kinds of matter. Um, we have the electron, elemental matter. We have the electron and the proton. So, and we associate them with plus. <sighs> not even close. Um, I mean, 50-50 chance, plus and minus. All right, and so the same could be said for these little force bits. You could say that they're plus bits and minus bits if you wanted to, um, but you know, don't want to confuse things. And this is the nature of charge. And this polarization is the nature of magnetism. Magnetism is doing the same thing. It's just saying charge is when these things are isolated, you can call it a charge. When these things are together, you call it a dipole. And it obviously has a magnetic component to it. It's um, what the red bit will be doing is different than what the uh, the electron will be doing, the, the negative bit. So it's just a matter of it. Now it has no innate velocity. So any velocity it has, it has to absorb. And the way it absorbs it uh, is through the interaction. And so, so just understand. So you have force bits moving, the speed of light. These things don't move until they absorb uh, energy. Um, and by absorb, I mean exchange, because they're fundamentally built with some energy in them. So as I've sort of pointed out, because of the nature of them, so this gets a little bit more complicated, but it's not that much more complicated. So the electron in bigger picture, you have to understand, has seats in it. And these force bits will sit in those seats. And so you can have three force bits going this way in seats, and then you have three going this way in seats. And that would mean that it's neither going forward or back. Uh, this is a now a, the matter essentially takes what force there is and has a net. And so this, uh, you know, a net uh, product. 
of the force inside of it. And the force is going in all three dimensions. The seats are in an arrangement in all dimensions. And it's just a potential in those dimensions. Now the trick with the electron is it has an odd number of seats. Okay. Odd. Uh, almost odd. Um, and the proton has even number of seats. And so a proton can have three and three. You know, three going this way and three going that way. So it can stay in one place where the electron can never stay in one place. It's always going this way and this way and that way or this way, that way, and that way. <laughs> it's always going somewhere. <clears throat> yeah, but it's always in that direction of whatever it adds up to. So you can just think of the uh, electron and proton as essentially a membrane, you know, a, 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 you know, a frame, uh, a surface <clears throat> that has inside of it these little bits. So these little bits are inside of it. And what happens in the process of interaction, so that's the plus two, um, is that through interaction, the disposition of this is changed. The, the, the things sitting in the seats are rowing in a different direction, um, and that changes the momentum of the matter bit. So for the matter bit to have momentum, to have a lot of speed in a direction, it means it has to be hit by a lot of rowers in the same direction versus rowers coming from the other direction. And this constantly is happening. The force, the field around everything, the field of rowers, okay, can be changed and lopsided by a magnet or something else. And we're lopsiding the arrangement. And that means more people are jumping in going this way than are jumping in going this way. And so this object will end up with a bias in that direction. And it itself, this membrane, will move through space. And that's what electrons and protons do. They move based on what this field, you know, the bias that's in the field. If the field has a bias, okay, because you injected it with more electron force, then it will move in, <clears throat> in the direction of that bias. So nothing moves, matter doesn't move until it's forced to move, literally. The force has to be injected into it, and that's called acceleration. And eventually, once it has that bias, um, it will m create a velocity. But the velocity can't be maintained because it will go back to having a force, you know, an unbiased field that it's running into. And it will lose its velocity over distance through drag. But I've explained that. But it's really quite simple. Just don't even think about the drag thing. Just think of the idea that the force, the field around a thing, is deciding what the balance inside the thing will be. Um, <clears throat> and so the only other trick to understand the two here is that these interactions happen um, specific to the red and the blue. That is, the red force creates an exchange where the force comes in, a swimmer of the, a rower of the opposite direction goes out. So yeah, it's called a reflection. And um, there's momentum gained by this. The net product on this will be an impetus in this direction, or if it has a bias already moving this direction, it'll slow it down, quite obviously, by giving up a rower this way and absorbing one this way. And <clears throat> if it's a blue force, that is, if the blue force hits the proton, it doesn't do any of that, okay? It doesn't reflect. It just gets diverted into one of the other parallel dimension. So it, the other tangential, um, not parallel, um, perpendicular dimensions. And they're always, the other two dimensions are always perpendicular to any dimension you're in. So any dimension you're moving in, if I'm moving this way, the other two dimensions are perpendicular to the dimension I'm moving in. Um, so anyway, so it's, it just diverts the pressure. So you can understand when there's two of these protons near each other, <coughs> The reds will keep reflecting, so the red one would reflect, and then when it hits this one, it's going to reflect, and it's going to reflect. And reflect means it absorbed, but it also it absorbed momentum in this direction, but it gave back momentum in the opposite direction. So obviously these two objects would move apart from each other because there's a bunch of reflections being created. Now if there was any blue energy in here, it would do exactly 
something quite different. It would move out. It would never reflect. It could never impose any momentum. Um, so it would be rather meaningless as an event. Um, in the sense you could never create this higher pressure with proximity. Uh, and so, um, and the exact opposite for the electron. So you can sort of understand the why there's such a thing as repulsion and attraction. Attraction is when you don't have any reflections, so you're attracted. So if I put a blue thing here, you can still not see that. Okay, so I'll just erase the red thing. Probably with an eraser would be better. <clears throat> so if there's a red and a blue, you could understand that all the blue force, okay, leaves perpendicularly, and all the red force leaves perpendicularly and you have absolutely no reflections where in if I put a red thing here you can understand that all the red would be trapped and it would infinitely just keep reflecting and the closer the objects are to each other the more momentum changes the more the rowers change in these two electrons with each interaction they're switching their bias so their bias is so when the first hit, this one gains a bias in this direction. First hit, it gains a bias. Then it gains another bias with the next hit. All the hits end up being a bias in one direction. So the closer they are to each other, the more bias they're going to be and the more momentum they'll have in the direction away from each other. And that's the repulsive force. And the attractive force is, well, there's no reflections and there's a bunch of this external stuff still hitting out here you know, and because of this object being in the way, there's no um, blue force that's able to get the blue force. I dropped the pen, so I can't really do blue anymore. Oh, where did you go? <laughs> yeah. Well, I dropped it in some location that seems unfindable. Oh, Jesus. Ugh. I sort of found it, but I can't reach it. Uh, oh. Uh, minor technical difficulty. All right, so there you could sort of understand that from this side, all the blue energy is getting diverted. So this can't get hit by the normal amount of blues from the field. So this side ends up having more pressure than this side. This object ends up moving this way because more rowers jump in this way than jump in this way. And that's essentially the function of gravity, which gets a little more complicated. I mean, gravity isn't a magnetic force or a charge force, but it's it's using the same mechanism, but all of that balances out. Just as much red gets blocked as blue because all of the poles, all of the magnets are in different directions. So if you turn the magnet in all directions, then you have no magnetic field. You know, that kind of idea. They all cancel out. But that's really, that's it. Two plus two plus two. So you have two kinds of force. You have two kinds of elemental matter. So let's understand that the neutron is uh, has been understood through experiment to be uh, an electron and a proton in close proximity and it uh, will degrade into that. Uh, so if we put a bunch of neutrons in a pile and wait 10 minutes they'll end up seeing a bunch of electrons and protons because that's what they'll just fall apart into. So that Neutrons are just composite particles. They're really not uncharged. They have both charges. They're dipoles. And if they're a spinning dipole, you could sort of understand that if that would look like no charge, because it's positive as much as it is negative, because the two are spinning. Um, and the proton and electron are just protons and electrons. And that's what the atom is made of. So that's the ma material side of physics, the, ma the boat side. So this is matter is boats, force is rowers. That's all. So just another two things again <laughs> to, to remember. Two concepts, the boat and the rowers. So it's another two. We can even go plus two again. So it's really very simple. Two kinds of force. All the motion in the universe starts here. This is the stuff that has a velocity and it's the speed of light. And obviously when I do a product of it, that is when I put stuff that has the speed of light, 
and I put a bunch of it together and call that a thing, that thing will have a net velocity in a direction. When you add up all the arrows that are trapped in that little round thing, there's a net velocity in a direction in space. And that's why ether doesn't work, because that net velocity can be any vector. Where an ether would be like a checkerboard. It would force a geometry and you end up with diagonals and the lines would be too long and too short and it wouldn't work. Uh, so it's just easier to think of it as just being a free particle. You capture a bunch of these little force bits. They have all different directions. But if you tied a rope between all of them, so a steel bar between them, you could understand that they're they'd have a net velocity in a direction. And that's what matter's doing. So you have this simple force moving the speed of light, simple rowers, things that have momentum, things that can capture momentum, and that's the matter, that's the boats. So the rowers that are now they're, they're, when they're free, they're just swimmers, but they're rowers when they're in a boat <laughs> um, and um, you know, you're just capturing the swimmers and you change the what the swimmers are doing in your boat you change where the boat goes and mm, the idea is is there's two kinds the kind that are plus and the kind that are minus uh, the kind that are south pole the kind that are north pole however you want to think about it but there's just two rules for how they function and the rule is is that if you if I if a swimmer electron swimmer jumps in a proton boat he gets kicked out perpendicularly and um, if a proton swimmer swims into a proton boat uh, he will exchange his seat with somebody going the opposite direction and that will be the reflection we see and um, uh, that will be the momentum change that will take place in the object all right, so that's another way of explaining it. Um, I hope I kept it simple enough, but it's really this simple. This is checkers, not chess. The physics, the basic elemental physics, the basic functions, and I'm, I claim to you this explains everything. There's not a phenomenon, there's not an experiment. This simple mechanism can't be used to describe how it happened this tells you how it happens okay so that's it <laughs> so i'll try again next time um and such so we'll call it a video i guess i could scroll down on a little bit of this stuff some of this isn't perfectly written yet uh, so reflection, exchange, and absorption, you know, so we think these things are different, if reflection and absorption are different, but they're really the same thing uh, in the sense that um, an absorption creates a reflection. Uh, let's see, so yeah, the diversion just means that you can't create, it's very specific, you're not destroying the energy, you're just sending it in another direction, so obviously when when this proton deflects the red energy, um, I mean this electron deflects the red energy, it means somebody else is going to have an uneven field where they are. So there's going to be more reds swimming to, towards some other boat, a proton or an electron, and that's going to have a consequence. It's either going to move the electron or it's going to um, you know, cause a diversion in the proton. Um, so everything influences everything kind of obviously in terms of changing the fields that exist. And you can sort of understand that all this change though would take time to get through a system, you know, and that you, if you have a lot a high density of these things then stuff can be happening in the inside that's very different from stuff on the outside because all of these flows end up just being trapped inside a small circumference. and it's the idea of the insulation principle. Things are insulated from other things by density and so you can't you can't, you can't create enough disturbance in one direction that's deep enough to get to the outside and so all of the heat could stay in the center of a vessel and that kind of stuff. I, like I said, it explains everything. Um, so matter is pushed by force pressure and pushed is in quotes because 
as explained, you're not really pushing, you're just exchanging. Um, and the exchange means you've given it a different momentum. You've either taken away from its velocity in a direction, or you're adding velocity in a direction. Uh, force bit absorbs, it causes matter to move. The implication that force pressure does not get to where it was going. So that's a key thing to just understand that when everything moves, that means it absorbed a rower. And that rower had a destiny. So when this rower is moving towards this proton, and it it doesn't go this way, right? It either moves this object a little bit, or and there's a reflection this way. But it the bit that was heading doesn't go there. It either gets deflected, or um, it reflects, or it adds momentum to the electron. The electron slowly moves. So the force bit that would have got here doesn't get here when it would have got here. And that's the whole shadow idea. So every time something is moving, it means it absorbed force that was going somewhere. And it didn't get where it was going, quite obviously. So when my hand's moving, or something's moving, it means that there was force over here, pressure, that didn't go over there. Because my hand actually using it to move. And, um, you know, that's the reality. Uh, the mechanism. It's, it's, it's just that simple. Uh, so dipole force versus monopole force is just pointing out that depending on what you what boats are in the sea, very different things going to happen. So if you have a blue boat, it's going to it's the field is going to affect it different than the red boat, based on the fact of what what rowers are going to be doing. The red boat's going to ref is going to be looking like it's reflecting a bunch of red swimmers. The blue boat's going to look like it's reflecting a bunch of blue swimmers. Uh, rowers. All right, so that's probably enough. Show me. Yeah, I just did that. I showed you, and you're still not going to understand, which is really irritating. But anyway, till next time. Such. and so forth and whatnot.